Cedric Maxwell podcast is powered by Price Picks, the exclusive daily fantasy partner of the CLNS Media Network. It's another NBA Finals edition of the Cedric Maxwell podcast. And like we said, we have a very, very special guest lined up today. Man, hip hop legend, producer, rapper. He gave you one of the greatest rap groups of all time in Public Enemy. He's Chuck D joining the podcast. I'm Joseph Pavone. Cedric Maxwell is here as well. But what's going on, Chuck D, man? Thank you for coming on, man. Appreciate you. Man, I thank, I thank y'all for even asking me. And then, then I got the great cornbread Maxwell. I had to school you the other day, Jose, on, on, on how, you you how mighty and, and how much, how significant this man was in my high school year because i think he was coming out of college and i was in my last year of high school and and, and i was telling my boys watch out for because we used to read the street and smiths and the street and the smiths it was a basketball magazine back in the day where we used to always kind of always look for the underdog the sleeper and okay. in the 1977 ncaa's this is back in the day when Brian Gumble was doing the broadcasting. Your oh, man, man. your man turned your man turned up. He turned up and took the whole the whole NCAA to the last second. So to be actually at, and also the modern day cornbread Maxwell that you know is somebody I listen to on Sirius XM during the Celtics broadcast. He be having me crying. Oh man, that's how. See, growing up, that was that was me, man. Oh, as a kid in Boston, man, it's the funniest, you know the most entertaining I, I, uh, radio broadcast, man. <laughs> I'm so I'm so impressed that you know a New York guy would find right? me in 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 the magazine and follow me. I always thought that was the coolest thing, and I'm sure it's happened to you a thousand times. Where rappers came to you and said, "Man, I grew up on you, man." I, I everything you did, I tried to do it. You, that is the coolest shit of all time. When I hear that from somebody like you, even when they speak other languages, you know. So I, <laughs> I take it with a grain of salt, man. We 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 here and everything, you know. We like a prism. We, you know, and I tell people, I said, listen, when you when you get to some significance, the light that shine on you, you are supposed to be like a prism. About have that light bounce off into so many area of colors. As like a spectrum, man. You distribute the light that comes to you, man. We can't, we can't take anything with us, and and to think that we could get everything is kind of, you know, on a greedy tip. So, I'm humbled, but like I said for years, you've been my hero, one of my heroes, and most of my heroes don't appear on the stamp anyway. Before any of y'all know, so when I was asked to be on the show, I get asked to be on a lot of shows. And a lot of times, sports shows ask me to be on, and I'm like, "Yeah, I'm a big fanatic fan." Matter of fact, these are my guys. You know, Nick Fan TV, my man. You know, CP the franchise will be there on Sirius XM as well as Nick Fan TV. But we ball fans. We ain't casuals. Mm-hmm. So this year, yeah, we Nick fans, but who don't want Tatum and Brown and company? And the underrated is Joe Missoula to get it. And, and, you know, only one you probably feel a little sorry for is is my man down in Memphis now. So that other than that, you know, uh, yeah, man, this is this is something. So, yeah, thank you for being being on the show. Now, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions, too, okay. All right. uh, uh, Max. Yeah. Like, for example, on that game, Marquette, listen, look, look the whole sway in the back. Marquette, UNCC. They get the ball to you, and you put them a, 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 a head, you know? And then all of a sudden, they run <laughs> the play. Man. And did, did, what do you think when Butch Lee was throwing? Did you think he had the arm enough to catch Whitehead? And then, you know, Whitehead, you know, seriously, uh, I mean, I, he, he fouled you on that play, bro. He did. he did. I mean, there was so many things that happened. I, I we, we went ahead, Josue. And then Butch Lee, he runs some kind of play, and Butch Lee has a, he gets in, and Al McGuire's looking up to see if he can throw it, and he throws it, and I catch the ball. And then what happened is that Jerome Whitehead runs into the back of me. I have never recovered that fast, Chuck D. He ran into the back of me, caught the ball. He was about to dunk it. All in one motion, Joe Sway. I was from that place to this place, and I blocked that shot before it went in. And then the ball was on the rim, and he tapped it in, and that's how my 
that's how my college career ended. And it was just weird yeah. because there had been any kind of instant replay. They were like, oh, hell no, that shit doesn't go. But uh, right. you know, th thank you for reminding me of that. I, you know, I want to ask you, give me your New York, you know, your New York Nick top five. Oh, that's a good one. Because you, you're a Nick fan. You got to be real with this one. And you've been, you've been with the Knicks for a while. So give me a top five Nick players. Top five Nick players easily is Willis Reed, Walt Clyde Frazier, Earl of Pearl Monroe, Patrick Ewing, um, Charles Oakley. But yeah, I, I, it's hard to give a top five because I've been following the Knicks since 1967. So the, the, top, the, I'm, ashamed, I'm ashamed of you. You ain't going to put Bernard King in there? Of course, of course. I mean, it's hard for me to make it's hard for me to make top lists, man, because I gotta, I can't, I can't make top five. It's like some pot, somebody trying to give me a top five rappers. I'm like, yeah, it's hard, right? It and, changes, and then yeah, yeah, it changes over a period of time, man. I mean, to me, you, you one of my favorite Celtic players to look at, but how many Celtics can we name? Thirty. I mean, yeah, you know, you got, you know, you got Bill Russell. And, and let me tell you this much. Luca, right? They they he can't exercise his birds' rights yet. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> because right. the birds' rights is being compared to Larry Bird. Not yet. <laughs> that, so the birds rights for Luca is just not gonna happen right now. But but you know, it's coming. But to think that you can be compared to Larry Bird and you under 25, that's crazy, man. Joe Sway, I got to hit him with what uh, E-40 said to me. I was like, I was like, met him, and I didn't really know who he was, but I said, nice meeting you. And you know that nigga told me? He said, ping pong. <laughs> I said, what? He said, ping pong, back at you. I ain't never heard of yeah, because E-40 be making up his own words. He be making his own slang. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the rapper that he is. He, you know, he, Chuck, he I had to never... tell Max, I had to tell Max, yo, that's not no slang, man. No one nah, says nah. that, just so you know. Like. <laughs> he makes his own thing. Oh, he like Flavor Flav. He, like, he, <laughs> he makes up his own language, man, and it works for him. He works for him. I mean, he, let's see, E-40 will uh, make up a slang and make a song about it, and then a uh, uh, hundred and... 50 uh, million people say it and not know what the hell he talking about. <laughs> when he told me that, I just like looked at him like, are you serious here? <laughs> oh, nigga, back at you. <laughs> yo, Max is looking at me like I'm a translator, man. I'm like, yo, that is not part of the culture, man. I don't know about yeah, that he, one. He, 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 he makes his own, uh, own, own culture, man. As a matter of fact, he got that whole Bay Area lock. So when you go up in there, man, it, it starts in you know, up in Sausalito, Sacramento, all that stuff. And then that language is what he creates. So yeah, he's one of the greats. Well That's tell funny. me about tell me about your 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 new Nick here. Your 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 point man, right that's, now because he's a bad boy. Right? That's why I can't. Name, that's why. That's why. That's why I can't name a uh, quick top five, man. But you know, growing <laughs> with my boys, Nick Fan TV, you might Jalen, take a spot. You might Jalen, take a spot. Br Jalen Brunson, when he was turned up, showing go all out against Dallas three years ago, mm -hmm. I was like, this dude right here. Is something, and I was saying, as far as the Knicks, I think we've been looking for a point guard for like, I mean, we was jumping up and down with Jeremy Lin. So, I mean, somebody <laughs> could just bring the ball up and not get stripped. We were looking for, you know. And when Jalen Brunson, when Knicks got Jalen Brunson, I was like, well, at least he got handles. And he won't get stripped, and and if he gonna score, he could he could pass off, and he is just end up being the you know the cat's dream because. In New York, if you don't come in New York with the right headspace, like it's social media before social media ever happened. Right. And you got to go in there, and we call it microwave square garden. You could get melted up in there. Or you know the old saying, I know Max probably know that. He said, You go there on a greyhound and leave with a, like, on a stray dog. You know, so, <laughs> right? <laughs> New, York, man, New York is relentless, man. So I think he had the right temperament humility 
strong parents that also was able to bring it to him, like, you know, get don't don't you know don't get beside yourself, you know, and and all that is a factor on I think, and plus the skill set, the ability, the work, the relationship with Tom Thibodeau, all those things were factors that nobody could predict, but all these things came together in a big bang that that is exciting to watch. And here as a Nick fan. We celebrate the great moments. I celebrate in life. I, I celebrate not years. I celebrate seconds and minutes and moments, man. You know, I mean, when somebody wants to put years on you, you'd be like, man, I got more years behind me than ahead. So I'm going to celebrate <laughs> minutes and seconds and hours. And co- coincidentally, it's it's been a weird NBA Finals because we lost three W's in the span of a week. You know, Bill Walton. Oh, yeah, yeah. Chet, Chet Walker yeah. and the Jerry West. Jerry West, yeah. yeah. Go figure. Go figure, mm-hmm. right? Some so, icons, yeah. All three of them were icons, but, you know, right. you got the logo, Bill Walton, and you got Chet Walker, who uh, who coincidentally, like, the NBA was talking about giving, you know, like, props to. I didn't hear anything said about Chet Walker in one of the games, so. Right. Right. But what do you make of what's what's going on with the uh, the, the narrative surrounding this Boston Celtics team? And I'm not just talking about this last week. I'm talking about the entire playoffs, man. It seems like uh, Tatum has sort of been in the forefront of, 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 of criticism in terms of like his scoring and his capabilities and all that. But Max and I over here have been doing this podcast saying, you know, what about the squad? I mean, everyone has been sort of doing their part in this run. And all of a sudden now they're one win away from winning a title. Uh, they're on this winning streak throughout the entire postseason. And it's like now they're getting the attention that they deserve. As a team, man, people and fans need to get off that privilege thing, man. If somebody's doing something that's great and you're a fanatic and they're gonna win and they 15 and two, I don't want to hear no criticism or what. Right. I mean, that just shows you spoiled and privileged. And I, I don't, you know, me as a fan, as a Nick fan, man, I'm telling you, man, I, I think if we would have got to the Eastern uh, and we were a game away from getting to the ECF, man, that would have been like as. That would have been a championship for us, knowing mm-hmm. that, you know, we depleted, we ain't going to beat Boston, but it would be, look, sometimes the game's just got to be fun, right? Yeah. It's just got to be fun, yeah. man. As a fan, what else? As a fan. Right? I wanted that What's, series, Chuck, man. I wanted that bad. Something's the Knicks, MSG. What? Eastern Conference well, Finals? Give well, me all that. I'm just saying that 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 sometimes the game, game got, look, we fans, right? It shouldn't yeah. it be fun. Why are we right. putting all this? I be telling people, I said, we fans. It ain't our business. <laughs> it's their business. You know what I'm saying? Right. Right. Enjoy you know, the right. show. Right. Yeah, they would talk about LeBron. I'd be like, they talk about LeBron like he stood you up for a date. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, LeBron left me with a check. Yeah, you know, you got a legitimate reason to be mad at LeBron James, but you mad at him for this, that, whatever. And it's like, yo, man. So sometimes fans, I think these phones and the gadgets get us interconnected to the point a little bit too much. We've seen it in the entertainment. We've seen it in a lot of things where, yo, I, I feel like I'm right with them. Yeah, you could feel like you're right with them, mm. but their professional is their professionalism is at such a high regard. Separate yourself from that. I tell people all the time, you can talk criticism all you want. The closer you get to that field, that diamond, that court, and you ain't getting on it. You're just getting close to it. Exactly. You better start peeling money out of your pocket. <laughs> <And> the, <laughs> the more you peel out of your pocket, you could get close to the court. You ain't right. getting on the court. And I tell you, it used to be like that on the stage. You know, stage is like you say what you want, but the closer you get to that stage, you realize that you can't do that. Mm-hmm. So that's why we Not always were, we were ele- we were entertainment value to always be with effort and high regard. Yes, sir. You, you, you guys are such a popular statement, a, a group of, of you know, of, of hip hop. Did you ever think that you were going to, when you started out, did you guys feel that you were going to get to this particular place? Because you are, you are, you are what, what people refer to now, like me, a living mm-hmm. legend mm-hmm. Of, of, of that music, of that genre. Did you think that you could get there? And when you got there, how did you feel? Because I listened to you in not necessarily your music, but I listen to your philosophy about life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's the thing that really impressed me about you. Not away from the music, just listening to what you had to say about certain facets of life that we're going through. And it wasn't the music, but it was just mm-hmm. plain damn common sense. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I come from good stock, yeah, and and I pay. I mean, my dad to me is the greatest greatest in the world. My mom's great greatest in the world. So it starts for them, and trust me, it's like <laughs> I had the type of parents. If I flip one second on myself, my and they and it was funny too. They'd be like, "Listen, when you see Chuck." Tell me, I want to talk to him for a minute, because this ain't. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me when you see this boy. <laughs> My dad's straightforward like that. <laughs> so I got people like that running jokes, but also really big straight laser, right? So, yeah. you know, we, you take that into the world with humility, man. And I, I used to say, I got no wings on my feet. I'm going to do now. I'm going to do my effort in my job. It was public enemy. It was so, I came in there as an older person. I started my career when I was 27. So I didn't start it was a, I was 18. It's a big difference, man, especially mm -hmm. back then, man. So I came in there as a person that learned everything about hip hop. The music grew up with it, but really detailed the study. And, um, same thing with black music and culture and arts and education and all that. So I came in there not with a with a, a with a wealth of knowledge, but I came in the game with an appreciation of the wealth of knowledge. And I was encouraged as as a young person to actually, when you see something that you think is great and, and, and it's okay to be a fan and a fanatic of it and learn about it. So that's why when I had to bring up, like, you know, uh, Max is like, you know, when me and my boys seen him with that UNCC, and he turned he turned up, and then we, he turned up at the Omni even more. And the Omni is the old Atlanta arena, uh, old swing. Okay, now it's, okay. Yeah, now it's, it didn't turn into Phillips Arena, and I don't know what they call State Farm or whatever now. But, <laughs> but it's the it's same. Amway, Amway yeah, Amway. Amway, Amway. Amway. It's the same yeah. grounds where the Omni, which was a state-of-the-art architecture, and I think y'all almost like kind of the NCAA uh, Final Four was that year. It was like only three or four years old as a state-of-the-art arena building. And in the beginning of my career, you know, I'm looking at these places that that Max played in, and I and I go to the stage with an attitude like, "Well, I'm gonna tear this place down," because when these players came in there and doing their basketball or whatever, I'm a, I'm gonna tear it down rap wise in the same effort. So we all trade off on each other, but it takes a knowledge to have an appreciation, and then the appreciation is the thing that makes you a fan, but also makes you a professional. Be like, man, you can't even get close to. You can't get close to me. I know too much of this as a fan, and I love it too much for you yeah. to beat me on a stage. You not it's not going it's not going to happen. So that's the bravado that we have, or we used to have, I would say, in rap and hip hop. Before I guess we 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 crossed the century line, and cats was a little bit more sensitive. We wasn't sensitive. We like either you got it or you don't. And if you don't got it, you're gonna get exposed. And if and, and and if you get exposed, you go home. And nobody wants to go home when they're on tour. But let you let you have four or five bad, you know, shows on tour and get white. They're gonna say, yo, man, we got we need another group out here to pull people in. And that's how that was. So well, you yeah, know this what? competition, everything. This episode of the Cedric Maxwell Podcast is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than five million members. It is the most fun and exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats for a shot to win up to 100 times your cash. With prize picks, you can turn $10 into $1,000 in a single game watching your favorite sports this summer. You can make a prize pick lineup in as little as 60 seconds. You just need to pick more or less on two to six players' stats projections and you're locked in. There's always action on prize picks, and this is the perfect time to try out something new as basketball is winding down. Make sure you try out eSports this month because every Wednesday and Saturday in June, if your lineup doesn't win, you'll get your entry fee back. Choose from Counter-Strike 2, Call of Duty, League of Legends, and more. I've been on a roll with these prize pick selections throughout the playoffs, and you can be on the same run. Download the app today and use the code CLNS for a free deposit match up to $100. That's CLNS for a first deposit match for up to $100. I, I got to ask him, Josue, and you're talking about exposure, and you're you're the guy I would listen to. 
what in the world is going on with the music industry? What is going on with our comedians? No, you with, stole my with, question. Like, That's a great question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Up, he did he right in front of you. Looks like he's just imploding with everything right. You're in the New York area. Tell me a little bit about right. that because you know it's crazy to hear what we hear, but we but you're on the inside and you know a lot more than we do. And it's nah, been a wild man. six months, nah. man. The last six months has been crazy. I ain't never been on the inside, bro. <laughs> I'm with regular people ready to knock me in the head if I don't hit their cash apps and die. So I'm just saying. <laughs> Trust me, man. I ain't in the middle. But on the peripheral, one thing I did offer myself, people like Ice-T, LL Cool J, Quest Love of the Roots, stand up, stand up people, man. It's like we're trying to organize this thing. KRS One, we have a union started by Curtis Blow, KRS One, MC Light. It's a union that's tied in the SAG after. The that's only thing that's going to save your genre and save yourself and make it grow for years and years is organization and acknowledgement of what you're doing and it didn't start from you. And I'm pretty sure Max remembers that time, but once upon a time, and this is another trip for you, uh, Jose, with ball players, basketball players, used to wear Dookie jewelry on the court, right? Wow. You remember that, Max? The Dookie chains? Max, Dookie did, chains? You, Max, Max, did, you, did, you, have, chain? did you, you ever wear any gold? Because I, I know you I played did. against people like Dawkins. I and I had Shut the, up. A, I had a small gold chain that I used to wear around my neck, and then it started getting bigger, and you saw people getting bigger and bigger. Yeah, and I then, need to see these pictures. And, 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 and really, the, and the connection is, it almost like went from athletes to rappers or rappers to right. athletes. Yeah. And then you look at your guy, Flavor Flav with the clock. With I the just clock. saw him the other day. I'm like, and he still got the clock. I'm like, damn, you still got the clock. Hey, 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 but he's he the hype man for Red Lobster. He's saving him from bankruptcy right now. So. <laughs> yeah, but, man. But, 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 he, was the, he was in the uh, the last series. He pulled up, right? Yeah, he's everywhere, man. In he's Indianapolis. My, my dude. But, but, but like I said, like, this was an important part for organization, not to be biased or racist. I mean, David Stern saw where this was going. He said, listen, it could get ridiculous if it get out of hand. So you remember the year that David Stern said, look, no jury. Yeah. Do you remember any uh, any uh, uh, flip back on that, uh, Max? David, David Stern, David Stern was, he was, he was old school. He was, we were, we were, excuse me, we were on the plantation, okay? So when David Stern smoked, everybody listened. Not too many people bucked against David Stern at that time because everybody thought David Stern was this nice dude. I happened to talk to Sam Cassell about this, and Sam Cassell used to say, you know, he used to walk around talking about he had the big balls and all this stuff after he made the shot. He oh, said, yeah, David yeah. Stern, followed him into the office, said, Sam, he said he was watering his plants. He said, Sam? There'll be no more of that damn big ball shit, okay? They're not doing that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sam said, Sam said, David, he said, David, come on, man. Come on. He said, Sam, I done told you, if you want to play, there will be no more of this damn big ball shit at all. And Sam said he listened, he heard what David said, and said he never again did the big ball thing. The new commissioner now, he's more in line. Uh, Adam Silver's more in line with the players and yeah. the development, and he's he's more of a a partner for him. David Stern was more of a father. He told mm -hmm. you what to do, and you did it. There was no way around that. Where well, he had to be the enforcer in the '80s, though, right, Max? Because remember with the with the cocaine and stuff was going on. Like, wasn't that the reason why they brought him in to sort of clean well, things up was, and be the enforcer? There was, there was at that time two things that Chuck will remember. One was the cocaine use, but also the New York Knicks, and as they used to call them back then, the Knickerbockers, the mm -hmm. Knickerbockers. Yeah, Knickerbockers. They, had, they did wow. not have a black player. And that happened to be in the newspaper, that word, the Knickerbockers. So you were in an wow. era, especially in New York, that was even more crazy. Yeah, it was one of those things where the great Barry Gordy of Motown, one of my heroes, said the boss of any great situation that you want to continue to go forward and plant seeds and grow fruit. The boss of L's situation is a logic, not a person. 
Mm. And, and it got to be logical and practical. So what David Stern been, did in that day in organization made people look at the NBA today to just pick fruit. You just want these players who are under 30 years old to understand, like, you stand on shoulders of giants that made you get what you get. So don't think it's about you at all. For me to be on a stage and not to be thinking about, like, what the Ozzy brothers gone through in order for me to be on stage and have a career and be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I got to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. I got to be like, you know what? I'm a beneficiary of time, commitment, organization, and there's a lot of bones I stand on. And I got to acknowledge that and kick back to that in order to make it grow forward. So I think the, the biggest difference is when you ask, like, what happened in, in hip-hop right about now, the lack of leadership, because you don't really need a leader when you do the arts, do you, or do you not? But then, are you doing the arts for yourself? Or are you doing the arts to enhance the recipient the of the arts? Oh, you know, yeah, like, right. I heard yeah. Brian Gumbel said this once. He talked about a particular person who's a famous... Matter of fact, he was a ball player, too. He said, you know, you could do all everything in the world, you know, to be a character, to enhance yourself, or you could do a great thing to have character and enhance the world. Mm, wow. Yeah, that's a nice big so. difference, man. I, but the the difference nowadays, Chuck, is guys or girls too. They're just creating their music. They're putting it on uh, social media. They're putting it on there. It's no longer oh, I need to go get a manager. Oh, I mean, I got to get this record deal. Well, well, I feel well, like it's well, different now. And, no, and like well, you it, said. It, they want to be famous. It's not about oh, I want to, I want to make an impact on the culture. No, I want to be famous, and I want that's to do it. Not, that's not that's not a problem. Everybody, I think, wants to try something to emulate what they think is famous to make them beyond themselves. That's all right. right. That's like me wanting to go out. I could buy, you know, the jersey. I could buy the kicks. I could go to the court. I could mm -hmm. even be my own announcer. Right? I could do that whole thing in my mind. I'm doing a hard. You know what I'm saying? In my mind. I think when right. you see these young kids, they on YouTube, they're getting their, their thing up. That's an unbelievable playground. That next kick up into being a skilled professional is miles away. So I don't have a problem with somebody like, okay, yeah, I'm playing guitar in my basement and I'm in Indiana and I and I keep, you know, and I'm going to get my, my band camp together and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And I want to get famous at this. But the biggest difference today is that you're not going to get that cluster you're going to get one by one by one by one by one. So I say, yeah, yeah, you're, you're putting your music, you're putting your videos together. It's an unbelievable playground workshop. You got all the tools in the world. But now if you think you're going to be a superstar, you got to you got to figure out what that skill set is and what and that avenue. How many people mm. that y'all see all the time that they, they, you know, just because they cross somebody up on the dribble, think it's like it must be some kind of league waiting for me? Okay, <laughs> who's who gonna be the one? Who gonna be the one to break the news? How many people you break the news to, uh, uh, Max? On that, <laughs> look at you and be like, "Yo, dog, I know." But way back in the day, you probably was a plumber, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that classic you know, question, man. It's like that classic question. Well, how old were you when you realized you weren't going to make it to the league? Like, yeah. Man, man, listen. Right. Who were you? Who have? And I've been. I think one person that I've been in awe of since I've been around this earth, and and I and and kind of met in a, a crazy way was Barack Obama. Have you? Is anybody that you've been like that that you were in awe of the first time you met them? Oh hell! Or, or you wanted to meet them, and all of a sudden you're like, "Damn, there's uh, such and such." Could be mm. actor, could be sports, could uh, be whatever. Well, when you study, you know, people that are, you're in awe of, you study them, man. It's just an endless array. Like you know, I come from the same town as Julius Irving. Wow. Dr. J was our hometown hero. We remember when he graduated from Roosevelt High and went to UMass. You and know, we're following the you, clips. You know what? You about to UMass? see him Damn. now, okay? Talking about Tell you, okay. you about to Oh, yeah. See <laughs> dude, dude, Chuck, if you ain't never been in a position where you about to get dunked on by this dude, it is crazy. 
<laughs> you one on one and you standing there, it's like you in a rap battle with somebody and this dude coming at you and you know what's about to happen, but you can't do a damn thing about it. That was crazy about Garden the Dog. I had the I had the opportunity to do the narration for Dr. J's uh documentary. And uh and you was in there, had a clip of you in there, and you were like, you said you know, 20,000 people started to stand up in the spectrum. He's like, yo, something's bad about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best luck. And, and, and I tell people all the time, just like it's hard to explain. Yeah, I, was telling, I was telling Joe, I was telling Joe Jose, I said, it's hard to explain the legend of how Cornbread Maxwell came out of seemingly nowhere and just took over the world, right? And then yeah. I was like, how the Celtics gonna get him too? And Larry Bird and, See, that's, and, yeah, this and, is, and, and McHale and the Lakers get the part, worthy. This is the like, part I want to hear about because I you know when before you told me all that, that in terms happen? of like how you've been a fan with Max, like I'm thinking to myself, this dude's probably a probably cheer for the Lakers in the 80s, probably couldn't stand Max or whatever. But then I come to find out you were a fan before he even got into the league, man. Yo, man, he he turned up just it's just like it's hard to explain. Here's his two other areas, and, and Max can probably relate to this. It's hard to explain the aura of Julius Irving when he entered the NBA from the ABA. It's mm. like you can't even explain it because it's not, you can't even put it in words. It's like, it was crazy. It was like, the, it was like, it, I ain't never seen nothing in basketball since then. It's like the world kind of like everything was like, because here's this dude that everybody been talking about mm -hmm. and understand this. And, I, and Max was in college during this time. George McGinnis came out of the ABA and tore up the NBA in 75. He just mm -hmm. tore it up. And then the next year, the ABA folded. They say, oh, the doc is coming. <laughs> now, I can't explain. Listen. ESPN, and this is my take on it, built their whole network off of knowing that highlights would be a thing that would be enough to put around 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Dr. J, right, coming from New York, Long Island, Roosevelt, right, when he went down and was traded to the Sixers, Warner Wolf on New York TV would show more Sixer highlights with Dr. J than the Knicks or the Nets at that time. That's He'd crazy. be like, Warner Wolf would be like, and Warner Wolf don't get no credit. He'd be like, matter of fact, let's go down to the spectrum in Philadelphia. Julius Serving versus the Pacers. Man. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he would show Dr. J highlights in New York, you know, TV. Yo, man, wow. it's hard to, yo, listen, it's hard to explain Dr. J. So Cornbread Maxwell comes out of UNCC out of seemingly nowhere and every, he's on everybody's mouth. So we follow as fanatics, the phenomena is hard to put in words, man. Today, everything is put in words and there's got to be a reason for this. That's why I said earlier before we had technical difficulties, Luca hasn't exercised his birds rights yet. <laughs> <laughs> you don't you don't compare anything to Larry Bird or Magic Johnson, really, because I don't even understand how Larry Bird comes out of nowhere in Indiana State and then all of a sudden comes out and it, it it's like he, yeah, he loses the the um the the final four final and that and that time we had like Four Final Fours that was just not really. You had eight Final Fours in the NCAA, starting from Max, because I think the year before I think Indiana won it, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and that was just like, eh, you know. But when Max came in and Marquette won and they beat Max, because everybody liked Marquette because of their their jerseys that nobody ever seen to this day. <laughs> they, had, they, 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 had, they, they, they had jerseys that didn't that you couldn't you didn't tuck them in, right? Were you jealous of their jerseys, Max? <laughs> I, I was. Go? I think I think somebody, somebody he said I was. Said Butch Butch Lee. No, no, it was um, it was one of the guys who played Bo Ellis. Bo Ellis. Oh, Bo Ellis. Bo Ellis supposedly designed the jersey that was worn at that time, and uh, yeah, that was a cool thing. But you had them. You had UNLV with the running rebels. The Reggie Fears, right? Oh man, big afros coming at you. But check me, I, I the first time I saw Dr. J, 
I looked at him, I'm, and I remember here Iverson talked about how he looked at at Jordan the first time. That's the way. That's the way I looked at Julius. I was like, wow. he just looked human. It looked like there was an aura around him. I Yo, there's like, an aura around Jordan, man. When I first saw Jordan, there was a gold aura around this dude. And, and, and it was so crazy, Joe Sway, that we used to, essentially, when Philadelphia, they would have a, 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 they would warm up and they would dunk. We on the other side, we stopped. We, I, would, I would stop and I would sit down like I'm a damn fan and stuff, watch, watching these niggas dunk like <laughs> And Jose, they had they had they had Joe uh, Kobe's Kobe's pops, right? Yeah. Oh and man, yeah. World, world, be, world be free was was a dunker. Julius was a dunker. I mean, Bobby Joe, man, they had all these dudes, and the, and then after do it, they do their dunks, and then Julius would get and do something crazy, and the whole place would go ballistic. And man. that's why I said when he first stepped on the court. And the first time I ever guarded him, he scored 45 on me. I might as well have been a freaking maitre d' because I didn't touch it the whole time. I'm like, no, or this way. And I'm looking at him like, damn, that was another nice move, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, was a, I was a bitch. That's what I was. No, I was a bitch. <laughs> Not even from the bench. You doing it on the, on like, the floor? Are you, wow. are you serious here with this? This dude, some of the moves, and he that was his that that time was his career high. He had 45 against me. And I don't know if I ever touched him the whole freaking time. Because I was I was freaking petrified. Then that was in the regular season. Then we played them again later on. I got used to him. And then we start banging them around. It was really cool. But yeah, man, that that New York connection. I hear that all the time about, you know, a New Yorker myself. I'm not a New Yorker myself, but Nate Archibald, one of my best friends. And you know he always used to talk about New York. He always talked yeah. about Rutgers Park. The first thing right. he talked about, nigga, you don't know nothing until you ain't seen Joe Hammond, the destroyer, nigga. I was like, what? That's it. Yeah. the destroyer. Rutgers Park. There's a brother named Joe Hammond that ended up selling drugs, but he was like, he was like that. He, yeah. he would just walk in, put his damn sneakers on, and then go out and score 60. Supposedly he scored 60 against Julius Irvin when he was playing at that time. Yeah, but Joe yeah. Hammond is that living legend. Tell us a little bit about Joe Hammond because I know you know about him. Yeah, I mean, you always used to get, you know, the talk because, like, Doc came from Roosevelt, and Doc came from Roosevelt, Long Island. See, New in New York, you know, Long Island, even Queens and Brooklyn was also considered country. There was one city spot that they said was city in the 60s, and that was Harlem, and that's where it was, Manhattan and Harlem. Everything else was a suburb, so if you wasn't coming from Harlem, you was considered country. And then further out along Long Island, where we from, the counties, you really country or Jersey or whatever. But by, by the 70s, Doc went from Long Island and turned the rucker out. Because, I mean, you had people like Connie Hawkins, and you had the rucker going on for years, and... They said Doc was, he brought in a whole new way of looking at things. But Joe Hammer was one of the dudes, they said, that never missed and you couldn't stop him. And that word got out and be like, oh, man. And it's like, yeah, man, the Lakers want to pick up Joe Hammond, but he don't think they got enough money. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, he got his pimp mobile. He, I mean, straight out of... Straight out of a 1972 black exploitation play. You know, I mean, people like Pee Wee Kirkland. I mean, those dudes was like, they was already, they in Harlem. They Harlem Knights. They like, they already at the Mecca or whatever of, of attention and fame. They got, they got local Manhattan, center of the earth, Mecca fame. About, here's a question I like to ask you. A lot of times people ask me about, about players as a fan and compare errors. Max will tell you. And here, they mark my word right here. I don't think you'll get the same amount of play if players, if you want to see a throwback game, put them in Chuck Taylor's 70s Converse's short shorts. Yo, how do y'all use the ball? Put, put, them, put, them, put them on the old Boston parquet floor, and that's how you have a real throwback game. You ain't even got to have the, the new players play against the old players. Have the new players play in old equipment. I don't think their well, unions will have it. But Chuck, they, they did that one time. They Actually, did? They did it, and for half of a game, the Lakers get Lakers versus Celtics. 
and Kobe Bryant had these short shorts on and all this other stuff. Oh, because they're doing throwback and, night. Yeah, 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 I remember that. Okay, yeah. Night. Yeah. So, so at halftime, they this changed over. Yeah. So he came over to me at halftime. He said, man, I don't know how the hell y'all played in that shit. <laughs> like, I'm you saying. Had exactly what you talked about. He had the yep. converse on. They had the short shorts on. And he Yo, Andrew so Bynum looked hilarious, and man. He looks so funny players. with those shorts. Yeah, that's I'm telling you. I stop. I stop conversations and comparisons right there. I don't get into this, that, whatever. I said, you know, if you want to compare the players now and the players back then, get, yo, Syracuse, Syracuse Arena is still standing there. Rochester mm -hmm. Arena is still standing there. Get them in them old arenas, take them in a the van there or a train. And then put them in their old equipment gear. But and number one, they're their agents and the lawyers and the leagues and the whatever CBA agreement. I never let that happen. But I said, if you want to real show these young people that this is what they played in, and that's where you start to see results. You won't see a quick crossover. You won't see too many jab steps and and an unbelievable because the equipment today is is exceptional that was the footwear is designed and you know i mean how you know and then of course i'm not even talking about like the medicine and the doctors and all that put them in their old equipment because i the first excuse me did, did you think that converse you didn't know converse drop the ball as bad as, bad as they were would, would fall you off that what you about to say because if you put on converse right now you walk down the street and tw twist your damn ankle. That is it. <laughs> that might be the worst. <laughs> how do how they do that? I, 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 it has that, no support I, at all. And we how they, it. Right. How do they do that, Max? Because in the 60s, it's like you got a tape job, you got a tape ankle job, and then you got in the Chuck Taylors. The same thing that, that, that fly girls be wearing in different colors, <laughs> right? <laughs> And y'all running a full court like a full court game in those? That's right. why. That's why. That's why you can't talk about Bill Russell. You can't yeah. talk nothing about Bill Russell because Bill Russell is doing all those things in them kicks. <laughs> and sure, no, and, man. And, and low cuts. You had on low and low cuts. cuts. Low cuts. With, with, with less with lesser ankle injuries. This episode of the Cedric Maxwell Podcast is powered by Game Time. Game Time makes getting NBA Finals tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to tip off. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and the lowest price guaranteed. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying NBA tickets. I actually had to put on a couple of friends, personal friends of mine, to the Game Time app, and they were able to save money on last minute playoff tickets. It's the best deals around. The lowest price guarantee, or Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. What other app is doing that? Your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. Take the guesswork out of buying NBA Finals tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem the code CLNS for $20 off of your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Here's, a, here's yeah. another thing I, I kind of don't like about the modern game. And when it comes down, somebody need to pull Lucas coattail, maybe Tatum's, sometimes Josh Hart with the Knicks and our player. Yo, man, everybody carrying the ball, man. Because mm. when you look at clips from back in the day, Oscar Robinson got that hand on that ball like that. Jerry West, that hand on top of tiny yeah. arch ball. That hand is like this. This I don't understand this, man. It's like, why is Adam Silver allowed? I mean, when you can bring the ball up to your head and have it on the side of you and still keep the dribble. I'm like, I, you know what? I'm going to answer this question for you. And let me tell you why. And I talked to him about this about, must have been about three months ago, who destroyed it, destroyed, destroyed the game. Patrick Ewan. Patrick Ewan, mm. he was at the International House of Pain. That nigga turned the ball over. He, I'm like, what? how he drip? So don't tell me nothing about people destroying the game. You know, and Chuck, as we like to say, you look in your own fucking back. You know, you know, you're talking about somebody that's destroying the game. Patrick Ewan was the first I remember. that carried like that every single time. I I remember. I, I Yeah, I'm telling you, every clip, it's like, poof. 
poof, <laughs> poof, <laughs> die. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I'm Nick, as a Nick fan, yes. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, uh, we're talking, we're talking, we're talking basketball in sense of the way it was back then compared to it now. But what about rap, Chuck? How are you feeling about the, the today's artist and how the genre has been? I mean, I, I got, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the whole Drake and Kendrick Lamar beat. But just overall, how do you feel about where rap is right now in, in 2024? Everybody got their audience. Your number one job to turn your audience out. Make your spell audience with A W E. If you ain't turning your audience out, you ain't doing the job. It ain't really you against anybody else. It's you against your audience. Make them like, damn, I ain't never seen nothing like that in my life. If they just like a, a, a millennial is like most of the time they like this. They, I mean, they, their emotions is in their phone. So mm-hmm. and people are like well, it's harder for the, it's harder to impress them because see, I was like, well, you know, they have to figure something out. There's things out there that blow in their mind, but it, you got to figure out that 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 straight line between I'm doing something and I got your attention by doing something you cannot do, and that's the bottom line of entertainment. And we can't, and we and we got to also look at don't take things for granted that that you can't imagine. You know, that's just because it's on a screen doesn't mean that it's real. I mean. We look at this thing sometimes like we look at an old Sammy Davis Jr. clip, and you'd be like, oh, he got, "Does he got AI going with him?" <laughs> Is <that> AI? <laughs> nah, nah. And it's the same thing. Like so, today's rappers, and this goes back even to the question you was going to ask about: Did Converse drop the ball also in marketing? Number one, in the middle of the '80s, they didn't pick up, and Nike came in, but Nike came in. Run DMC did my Adidas, mm. and kids was buying Adidas. Yeah, that, 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 that's what that's what's rocking in Boston, man. Like yeah, they 80s, buy, 90s, all that. Yeah. And Nike knew that they had to have some kind of hip hop in it. So what happens in the eighties, especially after that Michael Jordan game against MJ. the Celtics? Yep, said listen. MJ, not just Michael Jordan, because, I mean, basketball players have been doing incredible things all their lives, man. I mean, that doesn't mean you're going to sell kicks. Right. Spike Lee took Michael Jordan yeah. and Mars Blackman from She's Gotta Have It, a Brooklyn yes. B-boy. Yeah. Yeah. And Michael Jordan got street cred that he didn't necessarily really had or deserved. He was just an incredible ball player. Just a ball but player. That, but where that Brooklyn hip-hop street cred come from didn't come from mj it came from spike lee and spike lee had mars blackman and that combination boom shot nike up everybody had to have the air jordans and two years before that who who had to get what run dmc made people go out there and get my adidas now here we are in 2024 2025 and everything is everything is everything is anything i think it also boils down to I think it's a beautiful thing when a person is 45 years old and sitting at a dinner banquet and they ask, like, what's your occupation? And the person says rapper and they don't get laughed at. (laughs) I'm a college graduate, right? I'm a designer. I'm an engineer, all kinds of stuff like that. If I'm sitting at a table, man, it's like, so what do you do? I mean, what's your profession? Rapper. (laughs) Like, that's... That shit ain't washing in the 80s, man, or not. <laughs> and it, it's something I do and I could do well. And what got me into it, I knew that I had a voice and a know-how that nobody could match. But that, you know, I mean, yeah, it, it ended up being a, a, a incredible part of my life because I'm fanatical about the occupation, the profession, and want to make it so. But I'm also a firm believer that you write half your life and life writes the other half. Mm. Man, man plans, right. God laughs. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so right. but plan, but plan anyway, like Doc told me. So I, I just think <laughs> you know I, mean, what? I, I, I gotta hit you with one of these before you go, man. We we so appreciate you being on, but I have got to get you got to have your opinion about cat wings and just man, he 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 done he done threw shade. You know, that was like the second day of the year, too. Remember? That was the beginning. I want want to get it real from you, who knows the industry, but knows all these other people. And what he said, that is just, ooh, it's it's been dog-eat-dog right now. 
So just tell me a little bit about that, how you feel, because I, I love to hear your opinion about Cat Williams and the controversy that he's kind of stirred. Number one, you know, people say a lot of different things. I'm not a firm believer, like, you know, all news is good news. You know, you hear people like, you know what, news, you know, any publicity is publicity. You know, if you bark at somebody, people know that means at least they know it's that I, I, I'm a firm believer that that's not always true. I, um, you got people that don't like each other. That's just the way life is. But you going to tell me about somebody else, what that got to do with me? Ain't none of my business, mm. you know? Um, I think we as rappers seen comedians always in the area, rappers in the in the area. We, we try to get people out of the making beef real. Like, I mean, Tupac was like a nephew to me, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, younger bro, the whole, that thing escalated because what it did is sold newspapers, magazines, records, media attention, and we see it culminate in tragedy that they still ain't been able to get out of. My good friend, Jam Master J, who's the closest thing to a, a, a union leader you ever want to see, killed. You know, a lot of rappers got killed in cases that they never, ever discussed. So the, we tried to get far away from saying that had anything to do with the arts and something real. Comedians always seem to travel together, joke together, laugh together. And then when um, Spike Lee did the movie with, uh, with, with the four kings of comedy, that just took it to another level. Yeah. And... A lot of people are like, damn, man. Well, why is it hard for a rapper to travel? Yeah, well, you got to have this, that, and the other. You got a backdrop. You know, you got set. You got speakers. You got musicians. You got DJs. You got all that. All the comedian needs a glass of water, man. <laughs> speaker. Yo, speaker. Speaker, mic, glass of water, and a stage. And a promoter look at that. It's like, I ain't got no overhead. Mm -hmm. And the comedians kept rising and rising. Matter of fact, people like said, damn, should I be a rapper or should I be a comedian? And a lot of people took that comedian route and, and saw that so many places to play, especially during sad times, you know? And they yeah. all exploded. Now, they who exploded for whatever reason, that became a, a league of its own. And a lot of people like been looking at each other for the last 20, 25 years, and people don't even know it. Man, I, I've been traveling with him. I remember them back in the day. So they got something that all of a sudden fruited to the front of mainstream culture when 25 years ago, it'd be like, yeah, you know, black dude doing comedy, man. It was a big deal. You know what I'm saying? Now mm -hmm. it's like mainstream culture across a couple new generations getting in. Remember this. The businesses, whether they're promoters, marketers, branders, or whatever, and we say branders, because branding wasn't always a great thing in, for black mm -hmm. folk in America. I mean, the minute we got off the boat, they took that iron and went, brand, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and we got what? We tatted with a with a, with a a kilo, you know what I'm saying? A keloid brand on us. So they always want to be able to get somebody green. You know what green means, Jose? Uh, not, yeah. not, 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 not Celtics green, green. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like because, something that appeases, appeases everybody. Nah, appeases nah, audiences. nah. Green is getting That's somebody who's young, naive, dumb, full of uh, whatever. I can I see you coming. I can get you. Matter of mm. fact, I know more about you than you know yourself. Mm. And if you're under 25, and really if you're the typical, then you you <laughs> you know nothing and you got less. And when you get something, I'm going to get it from you. So the, the powers and the corporations and the businesses that be, you always got that in the mind. We're gonna get new we're gonna get new generations because they green. They don't know it all. And they don't they don't even know they know it they don't know it all. And we're gonna get them. And once we get them, we're like, gotcha. Yo, know, that that's a that's a New York in you because Yo, New York real. is always looking for boys 
And first thing, hey, yo, Green, come here a minute. Let me talk to you. The hustle <laughs> that you had on, that was like, because that in one of Stevie Wonder's songs, where the guy, yep. you know, he comes there to New York City. New York City, big, beautiful. And then somebody says, give him a, a bag and say, yo, man, run this the street from me. And the guy said, what? And the next thing, the police grab him, take him on. And the, he, he said, no, nah, man, I didn't do anything. But that New York culture, man. New York culture, keep it moving. That's why That's why politically, on, on, on what, 45, I don't even say his name, President number 45? Yeah, he done get he done game the country. The rest of the world's hip to this dude, mm -hmm. but the, he done game the country, and, the, and it's so crazy. He game the middle of the country. I'm not saying that the old dude is better, <laughs> but yeah. this dude. I mean, I've been looking at that forty five <laughs> before he was forty five. Like he a celebrity. He ain't fit to be yeah. president. He a celebrity. Yeah. I've been seeing this dude since the mid seventies, man. Yeah. You know, but. He, well, he yeah, wanted he, to start a network, and then they just snowballed into man, a campaign. He, that was he crazy. Using, he using old game, old New York game, on on, and and and, and he'll tell you too. I'm gonna go into the in the into the backwoods of the United States and met, met, meet with the people. Like he give a damn. But anyway, that's another <laughs> statement. Another another point. <laughs> that's for the next up, episode. Before I end this, another impression person, uh, impressionable person on me. And this is <laughs> Stevie Wonder, right? Wow. That's my guy. Every time I come in Stevie Wonder's cipher in his area, I can't say shit. This is for years. I don't know what to fucking say to Stevie. Mm. I, you know, like, and Stevie can see and hear everything. It's like, hey, Stevie said, come over. And I go over and I'm staring at him and shit. <laughs> I never could get, I don't know what, I, I never, I'm telling you, listen, Max, this is for years. This is the 80s. Yeah, that's the Max 90s. right there. That's his so, favorite. 80s, his favorite 90s, movie. 2000s. I, you know, and he'll say, hey, Chuck, there's Sin Fact the Power. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he must be like, man, this dude, man. He's like, he he don't never say nothing. I'm like, I don't know where to start, bro. I've been hearing this dude, man, since I was three years old in the crib, tearing my crib up every time fingertips come on. Ever since, hey, yeah. yeah so he's a favorite since I was three years old. Uptight, man. everything all right. Uh, I was made to love you, you know. Thank you for uh, all that stuff, you know, inner visions and all that. It's King, uh, uh, King Duke and all that. Yo, Sir Duke, I, that's, this is my secret area. I, in all my conversations with Stevie Wonder throughout 40 years, I ain't said shit. <laughs> I don't know where to start, bro. Well, I don't you know, even know where gonna, to start. You're going to get this to Stevie Wonder somehow. This, <laughs> yeah. You're going to have to figure this out for real. I don't I don't know where to begin. I don't how do you how do you how do you start with like Stevie? Huh? I asked you earlier, I said, who are you in awe of? This is yeah. the this is this is it. This is it right here. Yeah. Yeah, same thing with Smokey Robinson. I just sat across the table, so I ain't say shit. I'm like, where do I start, man? Where, where, I, I, you know, I, you know, Max, I what don't would even you know say? where to start. What would you say to Stevie? See, you don't even know. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't if, even know. If, if I would, no, I'm just like Chuck D. I would say, he, we, we grew up with his songs. My Sharia Moore, I was in love with a girl in the eighth grade. And I used to play the song as loud as that could possibly be. And I swore that I was going, this this song was going to take me to this girl and she's going to be forever mine. So I know what he's talking about with people, when, when, when he's talking about Sir Duke or when he's talking about, you know, keys to, you know, the, uh, of life. Of life. That's your favorite all, album. All these things he had on. You know, the one the one guy, Chuck, I wish I had, I had met after I end up seeing this movie was I wish I had met Ray Charles. Because oh, yeah, Ray Charles just seemed like he was so, you know, and, and I met, I had a couple of times to go see Ray Charles. I was like, yeah, I don't want to see. But after I ended up seeing the movie of Ray Charles, I was fascinated with his music no. and everything mm. else. I heard bits and pieces of it, 
But when I saw all the things that, you know, that, that were done on him, done by him, and that movie was a great movie. Uh, yeah, man. It was just one of those things that Jimmy really Fox crushed that role. Jimmy room. Fox did such a magnificent job. Incredible and, job, yeah. Then I look at another guy, a New Yorker, when you look at Denzel, another guy. Yeah, that, yeah. Do you say shit around Denzel? Man, you better not talk. People better not say nothing against Denzel. Denzel was protected, man, by culture and the gods, man. I tell you, <laughs> listen, when the LA rebellion went down in 92, Denzel was out there with a shovel. Denzel Washington was out there with the shovel in the community, wow. man. Shoveling. I mean, that dude is just, he he's just something else, man. You know, and so so there's a, it's so many people. I mean, back in the day, right? And I don't mean to go over, but you know, you could chop this up or whatever. Yo, Dr. J, me and my boys would come from the park. We go up to, they had a church's fried chicken in Roosevelt. And he had came back to see one of his, his old mentors and coaches. And him and his mentor and coach was sitting right, it was just us in the churches. So me and, you know, me and my two boys is like, we talking, but Doc is like in the next thing, right? This is 1978. We like, so what the fuck are we really talking about, man? We just... <laughs> Yo, hey, Doc, how's that thigh, man, you know? <laughs> What's your favorite piece, Ray? Did you get yours crispy or hot sauce? Yeah, I I, I understand when you talk about people who are famous like that. It's all Max. It's all right to be a fan. I'm telling you, it's a it's a beautiful thing. A lot of times, it's it's all right to be a fan, but not when you plan against a fucking guy. (laughs) (laughs) Of course not. That was wild, Max. I never heard I never heard that story, Max. That was oh man. Playing against this guy, and you got to go heads up, and then you're looking like, oh shit, this is damn doc I'm guarding, and like you know, and, and your boy's looking at you. And you know, after you get through playing, you always come home, and your boys go, yo man, what the fuck was that you did with the I got sick, man. I was, I was like you, Chuck. I couldn't touch. Couldn't. But then later on, but then, yeah. but how, how much did ML Car egg you on to just, 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 just be? <laughs> ML was ML, ML was a bomber. He was he was a circus promoter. ML got a lot of guys, you know, hyped up, man, because that was my guy, man. He was from mm-hmm. North Carolina. We were kind of country boys together. But he was the one that actually made uh, Kevin McHale uh, jump on uh, Ra- uh, Rambles because they were talking about it. He said, man, you ain't going to have no more fast break. There'll be no more fast break. No more fast. And the next thing you know, Kevin gets in the game and, and boom, he's like, he's like, boom, grabs around the neck. And Kevin is the scariest dude of all. I would have never picked him to be that dude to grab somebody, but he was hyped up by the hype man, ML Carr, at that time, so it was great. Wow, man. That's going to that's gonna do it for this episode, man. Sorry, man. I'm about to, I'm, I got to get back. Yeah, I'm yeah, so, yeah. I'm so in the arena. That. But no, man, this is, this, is, this is incredible, man. Thank you for coming on, Chuck D. Uh, man, we we'll definitely have to get you back on here for sure, man. Yeah, time. man. You know, Celtics gonna be, you know, sixteen and two as a Nick fan. Like I said, I got to shout out my guys, CP the franchise. We're over there, you know, uh, you know, Nick's off season, on season. I'm in the mosh pit, man, over there on Nick's fan TV, and he's also got the NBA report, so it's all part of this middle media uh, sensation. But I, like I said. I, I've been I, by default. I've been hearing you know Celtics broadcast on Sirius XM, and and Max man, you, <laughs> you remind me also of Don Meredith. At the end of the game, when that the end of that game is over, Don Meredith will go into a saying or into a, a song, and you, and you'd be like, wow, how did he come up with that? The party. <laughs> oh, he's over. <laughs> that my dad used to sing that all the time. My dad be like watching the game. All of a sudden, he'd sing going, "Turn out the lights, the party." You remind me so much of Daddy Don at the end, especially the fourth quarter, man. Right. Thank you, my brother. We appreciate it. Appreciate you, my guy. Right. Thank you. Joseph Pavone here, CLNS Media, and if you made it this far, that means you really like this video. So hit subscribe, make sure you keep our notifications on, damn it, and we got plenty of uh, great content coming your way.